The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. Sometimes it's even homeowners who don't know any better and they have a trap, they don't realize it's a female with babies. They say, oh, there's a lovely forest on the way to my cottage. They drop her off, she's probably not gonna live. Uh, and then a few days later, they're screaming babies and they have to call us. Then, later tonight. It turns out that in the absence of unmitigated, unrelenting stress, the female adolescent brain is a superpower. Maybe there's a new litter of raccoons in your garage, or a scratching noise in the ceiling that makes you think squirrels. How about an all-consuming confrontation with a skunk? In cities and towns across Ontario, people and wild animals interact whether they want to or not. New York opted to hire a rat czar to oversee their biggest problem. Does something similar make sense for the critters we see in our cities here? Let's ask Natalie Carvonen, director of the Toronto Wildlife Centre, and Brad Gates, owner and president of Gates Wildlife Control. Welcome to you both. Thank you so much for joining us on the program. Now, to get us started, let's get a sense of a typical day at the office uh, for, for both of you. This is actually a video of Brad Gates on the job with his colleague and some uninvited attic dwellers. Let's have a look. Thank you for being quiet. Being quiet, buddy. Good boy. All right, so I can guarantee that the control room was doing a bunch of awes because that was very cute. Yeah. What's important to take note in that video is that you are reuniting the babies with the mother. What you probably didn't see there was the mother was on the other side of the fence. Yes. Uh, tell us about your methods. We want to make clear that your business is wildlife control, not extermination. Your company's slogan is the animal's choice Correct. since 1984. So tell us a little bit about the distinction. Correct. So when I started my business in 84, the most common way of removing wildlife was to set a live trap, catch it and take it many miles away and release it. And I knew there had to be a better way. So what we started to do is finding methods to keep the family unit together, keep them in an area that they're familiar with where they can find their food and find additional shelter. And we, over the years, have we haven't perfected it because we're always learning on how to do things better, but I think we've, we're well on our way to using the animal's biology and behavior to help them get their babies back, relocate their young, and continue to live in an area that they're familiar with. All right, full disclosure, Natalie, I was chatting with you off camera that I spent the summer volunteering uh, at the Toronto Wildlife Centre, working Slide. with the, the squirrel nursery where a lot of volunteers uh, got their first start. But for audience, for our audience, tell us sort of the work that the Toronto Wildlife Centre does and how is it different from what Brad does? Well, uh, we are the busiest wildlife center in the country, so it would take quite a long time to explain all the things that we do, but uh, I guess to, to the point of this program, uh, we have a wildlife hospital, which is very busy. We admit about 6,000 wild animals a year that are sick, injured, or orphaned. Um, with regards to the orphans, I mean, we've known uh, Brad's company for a long time because we, we do consider their work to be very uh, responsible and humane, and there's very little licensing for wildlife removal companies out there, so a lot of really crappy companies are generating a lot Lot of work for us. Hmm. So each year um, we get requests to take so many babies that are I guess orphaned in the sense I put use quotation marks because they probably still have a mother but their mother has probably been trapped and taken away and dumped somewhere now hmm. uh, and all those babies are left behind and, and sometimes it's even homeowners who don't know any better and they have a trap they don't realize it's a female with babies they say oh there's a lovely forest on the way to my cottage they drop her off she's probably not going to live 
Uh, and then a few days later, they're screaming babies and they mm -hmm. have to call us. So, so we're dealing with, um, in addition to the orphans, sick and injured wild animals, uh, and about 300 different species. There's a huge diversity of wildlife in the Toronto area. Give me, give me a range of what type of animals you're dealing with. Many, many species of owls, many species of hawks, many species of bats, a, a, amazingly huge diversity of songbirds. There's deer, beavers, mink, uh, weasels, rabbits, opossums, so just a, a, a lot of waterfowl like um, swans and grebes and loons, just a huge diversity. Wildlife. All here in the city. Yeah. All in the city, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this city has an amazing amount of green space and a lot of natural areas, which is something that I think many of us really love about Toronto and surrounding areas. And we put a lot of resources into that but it causes a lot of problems because it means that wild animals are living in very close proximity to things that are not only a danger to them, but can be a frustration to people as well. All right. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to talk extensively about rats or mice, but I do want to talk about this um, just because, as we said off the top, New York just appointed a rat czar to help bring down uh, the population of rats. Does Toronto or Ontario's urban centres need something like that for rats and mice? Do we have a problem like, like New York does? Not like New York. Um, I think New York is probably one of the filthiest cities <laughs> in North America, and that is why they have such a problem. There's so, so much access to food and shelter that their numbers just explode. I think Toronto is on its way to doing a, a pretty good job at controlling um, some of the mice and rats uh, in, in our inner city. Um, and they've done that by just recently on April 1st, they introduced the no feeding wildlife bylaw, which is great because you're not introducing wildlife to people. And so we are different. We, we should keep our distance from one another. Um, also, the city has um, bylaws on um, property standards where we have to keep our, our backyards and our properties in, in decent repair so that animals aren't attracted and wanting to break in. Um, and just the green bin in itself keeps the food waste that we produce away from these critters so that they're not, uh, not again, multiplying quickly. All right, we'll get back to that bylaw because I definitely have some questions there. Uh, so, Natalie, it, it's good. We don't, it doesn't seem like we have a rat problem, at least to the extent, uh, to the, if we compare it to New York. But I'm curious, what creature is Toronto's number one mm -hmm. wildlife challenge? Mm. Well, it depends on which direction you're approaching it from and who you ask, I think. I mean, some people might say raccoons, you know, because they get into garbages or, or roofs or things like that. Some people uh, might, if they're in parks, they might say Canada geese because they poop a lot <laughs> along the shoreline. That's often when people are feeding them, though. Right. Uh, some people might say coyotes, you know, if they're worried about their cat who shouldn't be outside free roaming. That's a whole other issue. <laughs> uh, or their small dog. Um, so I think it depends a little bit on, on who you ask. I'm going to stick with the raccoons um, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of work has been done to sort of <clears throat> get raccoons out of our garbage and, and such. What is the best way to deal with them? Um, and I, I'm assuming a raccoon czar is not uh, needed in, <laughs> in terms of that. But I think when people think of urban centers in Ontario, particularly Toronto, we see a raccoon. Uh, that's sort of the image that a lot of people uh, see. What is the best way to sort of... And I, I don't want to say deal with them because, yeah. hey, the, the, we're in their backyard just as much as they are in our backyard. So We need a human czar. Uh, so in, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, it really comes down to human behavior. Um, we have a very, very busy wildlife hotline at Toronto Wildlife Centre. I, I think it's the busiest one in North America. We get a crazy number of phone calls about all manner of wildlife issues. I took a call once years ago, which is indicative of the problem. It was a woman who had spent the last three months teaching her local raccoon, who she had named Bandit or Rocky or whatever it was at the time, to open her kitchen door, come into her kitchen and take food from her mouth. Mm. And she thought this was a great achievement. Mm. Um, and her neighbors were horrified. You know, this raccoon knows how to actually open the screen doors to their houses. But so many people feed raccoons uh, and so many people feed other wild animals. Uh, people put food out for their pets who, again, shouldn't be outdoors unsupervised, but the raccoons get into that. Um, and I agree with Brad, the green bins are a great step forward. But if you go places like the Danforth, every, every restaurant and variety store has an overflowing dumpster behind it with all kinds of food scraps and the raccoons are like, woo, and there's mm -hmm. 20 raccoons every night feeding from there. So I think first and foremost, we have to look at human behavior. 
Um, I always talk about my cottage, which is in a very remote area, and the only time we see raccoons is on our trail camera, which is the motion-activated camera, mm. because we don't feed them. There's a provincial park there, and they just, they're normal raccoons. Um, but in the city, we effectively train them to behave badly. What do you say normal raccoon. <laughs> what does that actually mean? I think, like, for people who live in the urban center, a normal raccoon is one that's crawling on our green bin and, yeah. you know, sort of walking the sidewalks uh, and, and sort of scaring people or, or you know, I had a, I had a run in with a, a raccoon not that long ago. I was like, oh, but a normal one is what? Scavenging on its own on a trail. A normal wild animal should not be anywhere near people. A normal wild animal should be afraid of people, uh, should be not see people as a food source, shouldn't see, you know, Brad and say, hey, you might give me a sandwich. I'm gonna go up to this guy and see what exactly. happens. Um, so if, if they're left to their own devices in a truly wild setting, they would just be going about their business, eating berries and turning over logs and looking for earthworms and fishing for crayfish along the water. And, and if they saw a person, I do see a raccoon up there maybe once every five years, and then they go, ah, they run into the forest. That's what a normal raccoon or any other normal wild animal should do. All right, so uh, Brad, as Natalie was saying, some people welcome these animals into yes. their homes uh, yes. openly. Sometimes they get in in different ways. Now we do have some items here. Tell us what we are looking at. We'll bring this up on the camera. So this is a vent that exists on every home in Toronto. And roofers have gone away from the metal vents that were more formidable to keep animals out of the attic, but they could still get in through the metal ones, but not nearly to the numbers that we're seeing the plastic vent. And this would be on the roof, right? This is on the roof. It allows the hot air in the attic to escape during the summer months so the moisture doesn't build up. And you can see here that a squirrel has easily, and probably in less than two minutes, chewed the face of this vent off. <laughs> and then once inside underneath the cover, they can get into the attic itself. But raccoons simply peel this lid completely off, and they have this nice square opening that leads directly into the attic space. And this is where they go to feel protected, raise their family, um, and just stay warm during the winter months. All right, let's talk solution. Very easy, because this is what you yes, have. Tell us. Exactly. So anytime we do a wildlife removal from a home, we highly recommend that homeowners put these cages on top of the vent. That way the animals cannot get to the vent and manipulate it, and th therefore then cannot get into the attic. At the end of the day, it starts really with this, because you were saying this used to be made differently. Yes, it was made of metal. Um, hard, much harder for an animal to chew on or even manipulate, uh, but the plastic. Roofers have done um, a, a service to us in the sense that we are now doing more work because <laughs> of them using plastic roof fence. All right, very good. Natalie, I want to come to you. Uh, as, as Brad had mentioned, on April 1st, the City of Toronto passed the bylaw to make it illegal to feed urban wildlife. Uh, songbirds, of course, are exempt from that. Why is this important? Well, I mean, as I mentioned before, like one of the animals that someone might call a challenge is a, is a coyote. Um, but even talking about raccoons as we have been, if you, if you feed wild animals, then a, a couple of things can happen. First of all, you can change their behaviors because they now see people as, as good. They see people as someone to go to for food. And people don't like coyotes running up to them or their kids wondering if they've got a handout for those animals. Um, it, it's, I don't think coyotes are something really to be afraid of. They're a 30 pound animal. If I have to handle one, I drop a tea towel over their head and just hold their mouth shut. It's not a grizzly bear, but you know, they still do evoke this feeling of the big bad wolf and people are nervous, you know, if, if a coyote will just walk right up to somebody. And similarly with raccoons or squirrels, um, other animals will also lose their fear of people like pigeons or geese. People don't tend to be afraid of them, but they more complain about the poop. So um, those things are all not great things. But for some animals like pigeons and raccoons, if you feed them enough, you actually increase their numbers um, because the amount of animals in an area will be dictated by food, water, and shelter in the area. Mm. And if they have abundant food, then instead of having four babies that year, maybe they'll have five babies or even six babies mm. because there's just a plethora of food and they can actually have more babies. So in urban areas, raccoons are actually at a higher density than out in Algonquin Park or something like that because it's a great place for them to live. There's mm. lots of food. Um, I want to talk a little bit on the education side of feeding. Cat colonies. These are, you know, lots of people think they're doing a lot of help putting out food for cats and, and thinking that, you know, this poor little animal doesn't have food. I need to feed it. I need to, you know, but also mm. attracts all of these other 
animals like mm -hmm. possums, skunks, and raccoons. How do you balance that education where people think that they're doing good, but ultimately it is this reoccurring problem? Yeah, I mean, you re it really comes down to um, talking through sort of the, the fundamentals and the biology of what's happening with the people. You know, as I mentioned to you, talking about the fact that you're changing behaviors and elevating populations. I mean, generally, in all the years we've been doing this, you know, I've never met a mean person who feeds wildlife, you know, or who feeds feral cats. It's all coming from a good place. You know, so it's just trying to talk to those people and, and get them to understand that they, are, they may actually be in, be doing a disservice to the animal. So if it's a wild animal that they want to feed, if they desperately want to feed them, you know, then we will say, if it's songbirds, you know, plant berry bushes, you know, in your area or natural food sources for those animals. Mm -hmm. um, the feral cat, feral cat colonies to me are, I mean, they're not wildlife, you know, they're domestic animals, but that's a really, really complicated uh, issue that would probably require a whole show in itself. I, I'm a huge cat lover myself. Um, I worry about feral cats being just left out there. The feral cats themselves um, are subject to so many diseases and being hit by cars. I remember seeing one in the annex, the Blur Annex when I used to live there that had dangling broken back leg and, mm. and you couldn't get near him. He was getting just running away from you with this dangling, sure, incredibly painful, broken mm. legs. So it's a hard life for them out there. Yeah. Um, but then they, in turn, um, have an enormous impact on songbird and small mammal populations. So it's a complicated issue. Very sure. complicated. Mm. Uh, Brad, apart from denying food sources to wildlife, uh, what else should you know city slickers be doing to prevent damage not only to themselves, their homes, or their pets? Well, wildlife populations grow or expand depending on the amount of uh, food and shelter that's available as Natalie mentioned. So if you can control the food aspect, the next thing to control would be shelter. Now there are a lot of older buildings in Toronto and I don't think you could button up every house mm -hmm. so that an animal will not get in. What most animals look for is an opening about an inch by an inch and if they can get their nose into that space they can expand chewing on the wood or tearing with their claws they can expand that opening big enough for them to get their body in. So homeowners, if they're looking not to ever have a wildlife problem, they should install the screens we just showed on the roof fence. They should cap their chimneys and have the house regularly inspected to make sure there aren't any openings or that a storm hasn't taken shingles off that eventually could cause an animal to be interested in moving in. Because correct me if I'm, if I'm right, right here, about 60% of your calls have to do with sort of the roof. Correct, correct. Okay, that's a big yes. number. Um, is it ever a good idea, I think I know the answer that you're gonna give me, is it ever a good idea to poison urban wildlife? Never, um, and this is, it's been the primary means of controlling rats and, and mice. You can almost see it on the outside of every commercial building in Toronto, these black boxes that have poison inside them. Um, and Natalie knows this all too well, um, because animals show up at her shelter all the time that have been secondarily poisoned. So, and it can even affect the domestic... What do we mean by secondarily So, poisoned? when a rat or mouse gets poisoned, it's a slow death, it's a terrible death for them, and they often will wander outside. So now you have this animal that has succumbed to poison, might be barely alive or maybe already dead, but even a cat or a dog that, you know, may be at the house in question, goes outside and eats this, they can then get the poison into their system. But we probably see it more with wildlife species, yeah. where a, a raccoon or even bird of prey. Possums. Yeah. All kinds of animals will eat readily available dead or dying animals. And so yeah, poison should not be used. What control. is then, say with mice and, and, and rats, what is the best way? Um, I guess the, the alternative to that would be a snap trap type of, of a trap that causes instant death. death. Um, but yeah, that's basically uh, the only really alternative to poison is to, to use one of those. All right. But, but fundamentally, if you don't change the food, water, and shelter available for mice and rats either, then you will always have True. lots of mice and rats in that area. So really, 100%. it's it's like as, as Brad's been saying too. It's looking at you know food. It's looking at shelter. Why are there so many mice and rats in that area? And trying to identify the fundamental problem and deal with that. Otherwise, you're just doing cruel things to animals who feel pain just like your dog or cat does uh, in perpetuity and not really solving the problem. All right. Exactly. Natalie, I'm gonna come to both of you for this one, but uh, Natalie, I'll start with you. How can urbanites subscribe to the philosophy that, you know, let's all get along, living alongside and, and with wildlife when some people will say that, you know, 
some of these are quite dangerous in terms of, you know, raccoons can harbor disease, skunks can harm our pets with their spray. You talked about coyotes and, and, and sort of people thinking that their small dogs are for dinner. So how do you, how do you balance that conversation and get people to, to buy into the philosophy, Natalie? Yeah, well, raccoons harbor no diseases that people can get. Um, the only possible one for discussion might be rabies, but almost all of our raccoons in southern Ontario are vaccinated against rabies now um, through a program that Ministry of Natural Resources has been running. So, How about the one, distemper? Is that something people for... People don't get distemper. Uh, raccoons got it from dogs. You know, we do a lot of disservices to wildlife, uh, but people cannot get distemper. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's a... I feel like some people feel a little bit entitled nowadays that they just don't want to be inconvenienced by anything, you know, <laughs> which is a bit of a broader <laughs> statement. Um, but I think that most people, though, when you talk to them uh, about the fact that, you know, we all love living in cities that have an abundance of nature and beautiful green spaces, you love to go for a walk in the ravine, that kind of thing then we can't pick and choose the wild animals who live in those areas. So if an animal bothers you or you're afraid of an animal, then we just encourage people to learn about that animal. Um, I, I've been working with wildlife my whole life and I am not afraid of any wild animal. I will walk happily in a ravine system here. There's no wild animal that I'm concerned about. You know, maybe if I encountered a short-tailed shrew and I had to grab him with my hands, it's our only venomous, you know, little know. mammal that we've got here. Um, but I think when people actually take the time to learn about them, it usually brings that whole stress and fear right down. Uh, I can't tell you the amount of calls we get on our hotline about snakes, for example. Mm. And we have a lot of people in the Toronto area who come from countries that have dangerous snakes. We don't have dangerous snakes in southern Ontario. Ontario. Um, if you go further north, there's one snake that is poisonous, but it's a, it's a species at risk and you're very like unlikely to encounter it. So we get calls about people who are hiding behind their couch and they've got the windows boarded up because they've seen a garter snake mm -hmm. and all we really need to do is spend five minutes talking to them about the fact that it's a completely harmless animal and they feel better about it. Brad. Education is key. I totally agree with everything Natalie said. Um, part of our job in removing wildlife is our, the homeowners that call us uh, are sleep deprived. Um, they're afraid that the animal's gonna drop through the ceiling and attack their family. So we need to convey to them that that's not reality. And how we do that, often we get the call, they don't care what we do to the animals as long as they can get back to sleep and they no longer hear this noise in the house. When we go up in the attic and we remove the babies that you saw in the video and we go down into the house, we take a moment to show them the babies. And they do a complete 180 in their thinking <laughs> that they wanted the animals killed. The next words out of their mouth are, you're not gonna hurt them, are you? <laughs> so one customer at a time, we're educating them that wildlife are not dangerous and we should learn to coexist. And through screening the roof fence and protecting their house, they can have a long-term solution and not experience a wildlife problem ever again. What do you say then to some of the people who are, you know, upset that their garden is being chewed up, who have to pay, you know, a couple hundred dollars to fix their, their roofs, who see it as an inconvenience, but there are some, there's dollars behind that, uh, that, you know, they may, may not have. The problem was, I guess if you have a leak in your roof, um, the problem is that you didn't take care of your roof. So if you have a raccoon or a squirrel that's moved into your house, the problem is you didn't take the necessary measures to keep it out. So it really comes back down to, as Natalie was alluding to, it's people behavior. Um, you need to maintain your house. You need to, you're living in an urban environment where there's lots of wildlife and they all see your house as a potential den site. You need to take the measures one way or the other to prevent that from ever happening. And people, see, people don't seem to feel if there's a really strong wind off their roof or that maybe knocks a branch onto their roof and they have to incur costs because of those things. People don't seem to have the same reaction as, as if it's a wild Very animal true. who does it. You know, they, if, if they don't call their counselor and say, ah, the wind <laughs> damaged my house and now I have to pay yeah. $200. But they will do that if a squirrel did it, you know, which is, you know, to us anyways, it's really just all part of nature. And um, as Brad says, you know, maintaining your property, it's all part of the same package. Well, my last question to you, Natalie, how much of this is actually, when we talk about green space and we talk about sort of cohabitating as, as one with urban wildlife, how much of this has to be sort of seen and done from a, a, a planning perspective? None of us are really planners, but how much of this needs to be seen from that, from that set and, and kind of moving 
forward. The urban planners, mm -hmm. you mean? Oh my goodness, I would love it if urban planners would have even one person on their team who was a wildlife expert. Oh. The the last, in in less than, I think it's about three weeks now, our rescue team um, manager just told me yesterday, <clears throat> we've actually rescued about 500 duck and goose families off green roofs in Toronto. Mm -hmm. And that's all we can manage. Like they are literally going with their hair on fire all day long from green roof to green roof to green roof because nobody uh, really thought about the fact that we actually, it's mandatory now to put green roofs in new construction. They don't realize that ducks and geese see that as a potential place to have their babies. And then the ducklings hatch, they have 20 story drop to the ground because they can no longer just walk <laughs> off the roof. Um, off leash areas uh, that for dogs that are put right next to coyote habitats, right. you know, glass buildings on migratory flyways. There's so many things we could do with better urban planning. All right. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to leave it there. Badly, Brad, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. In the past decade, the incidence of self-harm, eating disorders, and other serious mental health crises among teens, particularly girls, spiked across North America, alarmingly so in many cases. Journalist and author Donna Jackson Nakazawa translates complicated science at the intersection of immunology, neuroscience, and human emotion for non-experts. Her newest book does that with the emerging science on adolescence in the storm of modern life. It's called Girls on the Brink, helping our daughters thrive in an era of increased anxiety, depression, and social media. And Donna Jackson Nakazawa joins us now from Stevenson, Maryland, and it's so good to have you back on our program. Donna, how are you doing these days? Such a pleasure, thank you. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring up this graphic. Rates of depression in girls have now reached epidemic proportions. One out of four adolescent girls report suffering from symptoms of major depression compared with fewer than one in 10 boys. Girls and young women are twice as likely as boys and young men to suffer from anxiety. These statistics cannot be explained by higher rates of awareness or diagnosis. They are real and they are scary to every parent of every daughter and to anyone who cares about young women. Uh, you also later write that our modern adolescent female crisis in well-being is not just a psychological phenomenon, it is a biological one. Uh, you know, you got a daughter, I got a daughter, they're around the same age, so you can imagine, uh, I get your interest in this subject firsthand, but let's start with the last thing there. How is this also, in your judgment, a biological problem? Well, it's interesting, and to set the stage for that, I want to point out to people as somebody who's researched the intersection of stress and psychology across health and development, that it's only very recently that researchers even began to look at how stress in the environment affects the developing female brain. Prior to that, if you can believe it, like so many other areas of medicine, Steve, we were looking exclusively at a male research model. And guess what? It turns out that when you look at the intersection of stress across health and development in well being for life, female biology actually plays a role in how stress pro is processed by the brain and how it affects development. So, those of us who are reporters are not surprised by this. But I think that that's a really important place to start in our understanding that now that we are looking at female biology in the face of stress and how it affects the immune system and brain development, we're start giving us ways to connect the dots between the environment we live in, the stressors girls face, and this growing gap between the mental health of girls and boys. Having said that, did you have some initial concern about probing the biological angle of this story? Well, yeah, absolutely, because the fear is that if you start to talk about biological sex differences in any way, um, even if it's elucidating and helping um, us to understand how we can intervene and help girls in this time, It'll be misused, right? The way that so many aspects of female biology have been misused against women to, you know, it used to be that 
a while ago, it was considered to be, you know, hysteria that happened around a woman's period. And we've misused our understanding of biology in so many ways. And I certainly don't want to say anything that allows people to do that, because it turns out that in the absence of unmitigated, unrelenting stress, the female adolescent brain is a superpower. All of the things we're going to talk about today are just when those stressors become highly overwhelming. Well, uh, I mean, it has always been a thing, teenage angst, right? It has always been a thing. But what are girls facing today uh, that makes it particularly different from past teenage angst? Yeah, right. So, of course, all kids are struggling today. As we see these growing rates of anxiety and depression in girls, boys are facing other things, right? Boys are struggling too. We see more prevalence of attention disorders and behavioral disorders in boys. But all of our kids are facing this this world that's coming in really hot and fast. The world is heating up environmentally, socially, emotionally, Gosh, Steve, 60% of kids in a recent Pew study said they fear that their school, here in the United States at least, will be the next site of a school shooting. And we've also kind of erased those middle childhood years between 7 and 13, the in-between years, which used to be about getting to know what you love and who your friends are and how to respond to the world around you. We've replaced that with this period of earlier and earlier competition academically and socially and emotionally. So that has kind of erased those middle years of childhood at the same time that the world is coming in so hot and so fast. And guess what? The brain during these middle childhood years, these in-between years, it has not wired and fired up yet to handle this kind of outer competition and evaluation that's coming in at earlier and earlier ages. And that's true for all kids, right? But as I'm sure we'll talk about for girls, the influx and the prevalence of social media in their lives is an added layer of, let's just say, toxicity. Well, you've anticipated exactly where I wanted to go next, which is it, it seems that as soon as girls turn, I don't know what now, 10, 11, 12, the competition to get that cell phone, that fantastic new iPhone, is there. And, and I'm happy to blame social media for just about every ill in the world because it never fails to disappoint in being responsible for so many of them. Is it fair to do that, though? I think that we want to put it in the context of all the other stressors that young people are facing. But when we begin to look at social media as a stressor, particularly in girls' lives, here's what we see. We see that girls are much more likely to spend more time on social media. We see that girls are rewarded for sexualizing themselves at increasingly early ages on social media. There is very, very little distinction between being a girl and being a woman on social media. Hmm. And we also see that girls are much more likely to receive shaming, critiquing, um, being put down, especially by men. And that external evaluation about the face, the hair, the body, how they appear, what they say, is much harder and faster on social media against females. And girls, when they receive this, at this early age that you talked about, like we know that you aren't supposed to be on Instagram until 13, but Meta's own internal reports show that many girls are on by the age of eight, right? As you mentioned. Hmm. So the brain is not wired and fired up to put this exterior shaming and evaluation and critiquing and this early sexualization and this performative quality in any kind of context at that stage of development. Let me follow up on that from this standpoint. And I appreciate that you said in your book that, that you have a daughter, but it's her story to tell, and you don't want to go into too much detail there. And I kind of feel the same way with, with, with my daughter. I certainly remember a lot of this stuff, but I don't feel it's my place to tell. Having said that, I think it's fair to say that in my kids' experience, the girls were worse on social media than the boys. You got any empirical evidence that suggests that's the case across the board? Well, what we see is actually both. We see that girls 
receive more critiquing and evaluative shaming from other girls and more shaming and evaluation for body, face, appearance, sexuality, and not living up to some mythical female idea from males. So girls get it from both directions. Hmm. Okay, let's go back to biology here. What is happening at puberty that can make girls uh, more particularly susceptible to what we've been talking about here than boys? Well, puberty is this wonderful golden time in development, right? It's when these amazing master regulatory hormones come in. And we think about those hormones, right, as things that we associate with the thrum of sexual excitement or mood changes. But really, estrogen, when it comes in, is this beautiful master regulator for the body and brain. It is helping those neurons in the brain to sing and fire together and helping the brain to wire up for resiliency in so many ways. But estrogen is also across evolutionary time, what we call an immune amplifier. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it acts as an amplification system for the immune system in healthy and protective ways in females. It is the reason why women can do so much in smaller bodies and with smaller organs and still make room for a uterus, right? It's the reason why we, when we get vaccines, we have a more robust immune response. Unfortunately, in the face of too much stress, social, emotional, physical stress, it flips to what we call an evolutionary disadvantage. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it's the reason why women are more likely to develop autoimmune disease after puberty at three, four times the rate of men. It's the reason why women have more long COVID. So estrogen is this amplifier of our stress response, of our immune response. Yay, that's really good. It helps protect us and protect our ability to carry another life. But it is this disadvantage when the stressors are coming in, as we said earlier, too quickly, too many, too fast. And what about uh, early childhood trauma? Can puberty do something to make the consequences of that worse? Absolutely. So across childhood, the brain's most important question is, you know, am I safe in this world or am I not safe? Am I going to be safe as I go up and become a grown up? One day I have to be out there on my own. If the answer to that question is not so safe because intermittently you're not so safe, then the brain begins to wire and fire up based on that intel, right? Like a computer chess game that's that's taking into account every single move on that chessboard. The brain will begin to fire and wire up to be prepared for the next bad thing happening. And we don't wanna see that because when we see that, here's what it looks like in the brain. It looks like the over pruning of areas of the brain that we wanna see fire up for resiliency in the, in the uh, prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, the hippocampus. And it looks like on brain scans, brain patterns, we begin to see and associate with depression and anxiety. Hmm. It, it also seems, and you talk about this obviously in the book, that uh, young girls are hitting puberty at an earlier age in life. What's the impact of that? Well, gosh, Steve, in the 1800s, puberty was at 16, in, in 1900 at 15. Today it's happening at 11, and here's where we begin to see that intersection. So. Um, Visually, we used to have adolescents would come in right before puberty. We wanted to see that, but now we're seeing puberty come in before adolescence. And what I mean by that is that adolescence, we talked about before that that period of the in-between years comes in between childhood and late adolescence, and the brain has a lot of experience in the world, how to handle things, how to respond to stressors. Is this a huge deal? Is it an, an emergency? Or is this something that, you know, tomorrow will be okay again? And when puberty comes in and it amplifies that stress response in that big kind of way, that's a real problem because again, the brain isn't wired and fired up to handle distress in that way, to even know, is this serious or not serious? 
to even know how to articulate what you're feeling internally, which is work for all of us across the lifespan, or to even know how to ask for help to recognize how I'm feeling is not okay. I need to ask mom and dad, what is, what, what is this that's happening to me? I need some help here. Hmm. Well, now that we've completely terrified anybody who has a young girl who is on the verge of all of this, uh, we know there are parents who are looking for advice to understand how to best handle uh, the years to come in some cases, or if they're in the midst of it right now. So let's do that. Where should parents even begin as it relates to handling these issues? Well, the first thing to remember is we're all doing our absolute best as parents. You're a parent, I'm a parent, I have two kids. We aren't gonna do it perfectly and that's okay. Just start where you are. So many times I have parents say to me, my daughter's already struggling, you know, I messed this up or I'm not doing it right. And the truth is that when we begin to put in the 15 antidotes that all the experts that I ran around and called agreed upon can really make a shift in girls health and neurobiology and are neurobiologically protective. When we begin to put those in place, wherever we are, wherever we begin, it makes a profound shift in our relationship with our daughters and in their health and well-being and in their relationship with themselves and with this world. Yeah, let's hit on some of those 15 antidotes that you just referenced, because you do spend half the book talking about that. And I guess, um, well, let's start here. Parents you say need to consider their own background, their own stress levels, their own past trauma as it relates to trying to deal with their daughters. Why is that important? Absolutely. Well, we know that when we have a history of a lot of stress and trauma, and who among us doesn't at this point, um, and when we have a history of a lot of adversity and trauma over time, just as we talked about how stress and adversity can begin to affect health and development in young people, it is also true for us when we were growing up and when we were young that a lot of adversity in childhood or chronic unpredictable stressors shifts our ability to regulate our own stress response. What do I mean by that? A really difficult moment comes up, maybe in family life, maybe you're standing in the kitchen, maybe you're in the living room, maybe you're driving your child in the car and they tell you something or don't tell you something and your stress response is going up because you know something is going on, you're worried. Well, when we've had an a history of adversity, Guess what happens when we face another potentially big stressor? We go into fight, flight, freeze, but we also lose our ability to think clearly and be the kind of parent we wanna be in that moment. Our brain and our higher level thinking, we cannot access it in that moment. It just goes poof, right off, right out of our minds. So what we wanna do is notice and get really discreet about noticing how we feel and how we respond in those moments of connection where our child needs us to be the very best parent that we can be. And if we find that we're caught up in kind of managing our own anxiety and distress and kind of bringing ourselves back to level playing field and grounding ourselves and that we can't really be there for our child, in a way that makes them feel safe and seen and known and valued, what we call technically parent-child attunement, hmm. then the work really begins with us because that is what our children need in that moment, especially in this world that we're living in. They need to know that when they come to us, we see them, we are not gonna be so caught up in fixing or being the detective or managing our own distress that they can actually find that they are soothed for what they're going through in that moment. And that's where the work really begins for many of us as parents. And I raise my hand here as the very first among them. <laughs> well, doesn't that just speak to being a good listener? I mean, at the end of the day, they just want to be heard, yes? They just want to be heard, but they also want to know that they aren't just being heard, they're being heard in a way that we are stepping out of it with our needs and questions and evaluations. 
And that is really harder to do than it sounds. When I talk to parents, that is often one of the hardest things that they find in their parenting journey to be that kind of parent who can support a child, particularly one who's struggling. Remember that all that we've talked about here tells us that it takes a while for a a young person to even begin to know what they're feeling, to articulate what they're feeling. And as parents, we've spent our lifetimes and re reasonably so being the fixer, right? Mm. Your kid falls down, you got to fix it, put a Band-Aid on it, get the back teen. We are motivated to help our children from the moment we get up to the moment we go to bed. But in many ways, we have to take ourselves on another journey. And in the book, oh my gosh, I think I have over a hundred scripts. Because when your brain flies offline, it can actually help you to rewire and refire your own brain as a parent by having scripts at hand. I've had parents tell me they're pasting them on the inside of their kitchen cabinets, you know, <laughs> or under the visor of the car, because it sounds really easy to do. But if you have ever really been worried about your child, as I have really been worried about my child, you will find in that moment that your best words are hard to find. Do you have to be careful about running the risk of being overprotective and therefore denying your child the opportunity to develop skills of resiliency, which they will surely need throughout the course of their lives. 100%, because we know that during that period of development, we want to see the brain wire up, as you said, for resiliency. And it does that by meeting a little wobble in the world, right? We don't wanna solve all our children's problems. We have to give them the time and the space and have conversations with them so that we can discern, is this a child-sized problem or is it an adult-sized problem that needs adult help? And that is a really important thing because we don't want to be like driving to school with a forgotten paper. We want to help kids realize they can deal with a lot of things on their own, right? We want their brain to wire and fire up for that sense of competence and a self-assuredness that, hey, you know, if I make a mistake, I've made them before. I know what to do in this situation. It doesn't mean they aren't coming to you for advice, but you aren't taking over. Hmm. Donna, let's finish up on this. And again, I want to respect your privacy with your daughter in asking this question, but I wonder whether you have... Uh, taken to heart and implemented yourself these antidotes that you've written about and whether they've always worked? I would say that my short answer before I give a longer answer is that if only, if only, if only, Steve, if only this science and if only I had done this reporting 10 years ago, I would feel... I, I, I wish, I wish, and I say in the book, I wish I had reported this before my daughter hit these really important years. And yet I will add to that in my longer answer that honestly, it has made such a difference. It's made such a difference for how I am in the room with my daughter, even when she's facing really, really hard things. And I'll throw in one statistic here. One of the studies I report on in the book shows that the greatest, most significant uh, factor of flourishing across these difficult years is one thing, can this child come and talk to you about anything, no matter how difficult? Hmm. And you know what, the work, the 15 antidotes in this book, they're about that, but they're also about knowing sometimes that maybe you aren't enough and you have to bring in the wider world. Wonderful. Donna Jackson Nakazawa, her latest is Girls on the Brink, helping our daughters thrive in an era of increased anxiety, depression, and social media. We're always so grateful for your visits to our program, Donna. Until next time. Such a pleasure. Thank you. It is the dead of winter. The roads can be slushy, icy, or just plain impassable with whiteouts and drifts of uncleared snow. But we're Canadian, so we know how to drive in such weather, right? Not so fast. Constable Sean Shapiro of the Toronto Police Service, known to more than half a million TikTok users as the face of at traffic services, 
see signs all over the place that Ontario drivers could use a few pointers. And he's here in our studio to share some of those. Nice to meet you finally. Nice to meet you too. You're a bit of a big star. I guess you know that. I, I, I've heard rumors. <laughs> okay, let's, let's start with this. We're Canadian. We should know how to drive in the winter. Do we, in fact, that we take added precaution in the winter because we know it's dangerous? There's a lot of people who are fantastic drivers and there's a lot of people who think they are fantastic drivers <laughs> and there's a big divide between them. Uh, we, we tend not to drive appropriately for the weather conditions. We don't slow down. We don't give ourselves that extra time we need to be safe. And, and that causes a lot of problems on the road. What do you see more than anything else? There's an overconfidence with four-wheel drive vehicles, all-wheel drive vehicles, where people think they can just uh, get up and go and they're impervious to the elements because of it. Uh, we got news for them. Four-wheel slide when you're trying to brake just as well as two-wheel drive vehicles, and uh, that's, that's, a, that's a major thing. When it is snowing outside, I always find it amazing in this town, half an inch of snow and people forget everything. They forget how to drive. What should they do even before they get into the car to prepare themselves for a little bit of sprinkle? Well, aside from the fact they should be making sure that their vehicle is in good shape, they know that all the snow is cleared, their windows are clear, that's a huge problem. Uh, they should be ready to go. Uh, they, should be cap they should be confident that they're safe to drive, uh, they, they, whether it be that they've arrested, that they're not uh, impaired by anything, and they should know where they're going. Being totally reliant on a GPS is dangerous. Uh, not being ready, uh, having a, at very least a basic understanding of where they're going hmm. could get them into problems. Last minute uh, lane changes, light, last minute uh, turns. Those are things that don't mix well with uh, slippery weather. Salt, shovel in the car, necessary? Well, I actually have a list and the, of things that you should always keep in the car, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the winter. Uh, and I'll look at that right now. It's, mm -hmm. it's a, a cell phone and charger. People forget that uh, batteries go dead. And if you have a cell phone charger or a battery backup that's independent of the vehicle, even better, because you can take it with you when you go to get warm somewhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, a blanket, extra warm clothes, food and water. Uh, water obviously will freeze in the winter, but having something there uh, is better than not having it at all. Uh, but flashlights, batteries, first aid kits, jumper cables, uh, road salt and kitty litter is a, is a good suggestion. Kitty litter? Something that you can put under the tires to oh, get traction. Right. And uh, you'll take what you can get. If you can get uh, salt, that's great. Uh, mm -hmm. But having even a small amount of it is better than not having it. Uh, and then uh, just your obvious stuff of ice scrapers and snow brushes. Inc mm -hmm. Incredibly important. Matches and a candle. If you can't create a heat anywhere and you're stuck for a long period of time, these are things that can keep you warm. What percentage of drivers, based on your experience, would you say come with those, what do you got there, 13 items in their cars? I would say 99% uh, don't. 99% don't. I, I am guesstimating, but mm. uh, the truth is I don't even carry all of these things in my car mm. uh, because I live in, in the city of Toronto and I find that where I'm going, uh, I, I'm not generally going to need all of these things, but it's best practices to have it. And if you can do it, great. I've got friends who are really diligent and they have all this and more. You know, they, they drive all the time with boots that are capable of uh, uh, keeping them warm when they're digging through. They have a change of clothes in case they're out trying to huh. dig their cars out of a ditch and they get wet and then they're still waiting for help. And you hear about people who are waiting for a long time for roadside assistance. That's really planning ahead. That's impressive. If you have an electric vehicle, should that list look any different? Not really. Electric vehicles, uh, something that many people don't understand is that uh, they, their charges and range aren't what they uh, they could be mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the summertime. Batteries don't tend to last as long in the yeah. cold. Uh, so you may have actually more cause to use these. Uh, but the good thing with, uh, with the electric vehicles is they can run heaters uh, until the battery dies. Mm -hmm. Should you use your cruise control in the winter? Cruise control is a funny thing. Uh, older cars especially you shouldn't because they don't generally have the ability to sense the slippery uh, nature of the road. And you could actually find yourself losing control because of the cruise control. So it would be suggested you don't use cruise control. Ever in the winter? Not in the winter. Modern cars have traction control and all sorts of other sensors working to help you. But at the end of the day, being uh, someone who drives to the conditions, so slowing down, driving appropriately, and staying focused on driving, nothing else, that's going to be the best thing for you. When I took my driving test 120 years ago, they told me that when you go into a skid, turn in the direction of the skid. Is that still the best advice? Look where you want to go, and, uh, and, and that's where you want to steer. Looking, looking and steering into the skid could actually cause you to spin. Uh, hmm. So it really depends. Uh, the best advice that I can give is to, to, if you're slowing down, giving yourself all sorts of space, you're going to avoid the skid. And that's what you want to do. Once you're in the skid, very often, it's too late. If you're on the road and there's a snowplow in front of you, and you're in a hurry because everybody is, what do you do? You don't pass it. 
uh, regardless of whether or not you can legally pass it, which is a, a question, it, it's dangerous. Uh, the, the road ahead is unplowed, potentially unsalted, and incredibly slippery, not to mention the fact that there are large grooves in the snow. If you manage to get by and don't cause a collision, which you, you, you're likely going to, uh, but you would want to stay behind patiently for the nice smooth surface that they're creating, which is the whole reason they're out there. They're there for your safety. So stay away from them. They're big trucks. They need lots of room to operate. And we hear stories all the time about the, the large blades that they carry for clearing the snow, uh, coming into contact with cars that are trying to pass it. And then those cars end up being damaged and, and thrown out of the way. You could be charged for careless driving uh, if you do pass it and it's an unsafe maneuver. So j just don't risk it. Generally speaking, are police officers more on the lookout in the winter for bad driving? than they would be in the summer. I'd say it's no change. We're always looking for people who are looking to make the roads unsafe with their behavior. So whether it's dry and they're going faster uh, or they're going slower but still being unsafe, mm -hmm. we're, we're looking out for that. We have a Vision Zero enforcement team that's out all the time and they're looking for those who choose to speed, drive aggressively, drive distracted or drive impaired and that's regardless of the season. How about pedestrians? They obviously should be taking extra special caution during the winter time, yes? Absolutely. If we're seeing issues with drivers, and then you add the fact that uh, you know pedestrians are out there, uh, it's just more mix. And we always have pedestrians. We are a city with people everywhere, and it's great. But we very often have pedestrians who assume the car is going to do the right thing or be able to stop, and assuming is very dangerous. Uh, they step out onto the road potentially before making contact, eye contact with the uh, the driver, or waiting for the vehicle to come to a complete stop. It's incredible how much movement we can get of a vehicle that is not actually stopped mm. and it breaks free of traction and continues to slide through an intersection. If you're a pedestrian who assumed they were going to stop, that might be you getting hit. Are there conditions under which you recommend absolutely no driving, it's too bad, and if there are, what does that look like? If there's zero visibility, if the ice and snow in your accumulation is just it's unlikely that you're gonna to get to where you're going, then why bother? It has to be an emergency. And even then, a true emergency, call 911, have the paramedics, police, fire. They're the ones that will brave the elements if they have to. But you know, only you can decide what's worth it for you. We don't tell people they have to stay home unless there's an order like that, mm -hmm. uh, and that's very rare. So if you believe and you have you know, the appropriate uh, vehicle uh, and, and you can make it to where you have to go safely, and it's really that important, then you have to make that decision. But very often we have people who are not used to driving in the weather or not capable of driving. They don't even like it. They're stressed out from it. Mm. That's if you, if you yourself hang, have anxiety about getting on the road that day, it's probably an indication you shouldn't be driving that day. That's uh, the voiceover cop at Traffic Services, Sean Sapiro. Thanks so much for coming into TVO tonight and helping us out with this. My pleasure. Tomorrow on the agenda, it is all our responsibility to have the talk at our dinner tables, with our children, with our colleagues in the lunchroom. It is all our responsibility to have the talk and hold us each accountable for the ills of racism. That's tomorrow on the agenda.